I thought what we would do is what Larry and I did yesterday <coughs> when we were in uh, Norfolk. Now, I pronounced that word wrong. I'm used to Norfolk, Virginia, and I was clarified when I was in there. It's Norfolk. So i got to make sure I got that right. We decided yesterday that on Tuesday we had a judge that came to the training, but he snuck out on me early. So we decided to change the presentation around, have Larry, then I go, so that way the judge is still here and I can talk about what role he's going to play, because I think he's one of the key players that came to the training. He has a lot of discretion, and I think one of the take-home pieces is yesterday when we met with the judge down there in Norfolk, he said, after today, I'm going to have a meeting with my judges on this issue. So I think the judge can do a lot, and I'm happy that he's here. We also had some prosecutors in Lexington. I hope there are some prosecutors here, because this is applicable not only to the victim of a crime, and I'm going to go into that a little bit. Child witnesses, it may have FASD. A lot of prosecutors, even in California, will say, I'm not going to file this case. This is a child with FASD. He or she's not credible. That's because that prosecutor has a lack of training in the FASD field. You guys are probably wondering, what is this stuff up here? This is my alcohol. I don't like statistics like Larry does, but I love experiments. And we're going to have one today when we talk about how to interview the mother. A critical role in the lawyer, the social worker, the doctor. What questions to ask the mother, how to interview her, and how to get the results that we need so that we can go on and get the diagnosis that is so critical. But more importantly, as Larry mentioned, how do we go about building a rapport with that mother. And I can't tell you, when I first started practice in law, this is my first case. This is AJ. He was sentenced to death in Florida as a juvenile. And we think he probably had FASD. I never knew what tools to find, what articles to read on how to interview a birth mother. And we're going to provide you with those tools. One of the things that Larry have just finished doing, we're working on an article that's going to be published hopefully by this summer. It goes into maternal alcohol history. And one of the takeaway messages is do not try to interview the birth mother without having some training first. Because she will shut down on you or she will be in denial, or she will lie. Because she thinks that you are blaming her, and it may not, as Larry said, be her fault that she has a substance abuse problem. So when we build the relationship with the mother, maybe we can convince her to go into some treatment and prevent subsequent births, siblings, kids with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. We're going to start with the judge. I'm going to go back here for a second. Look at that photo. Look at that kid. Does anyone recognize who that is? Larry likes to buy cheeseburgers. I'll buy you a steak tonight. Larry and I agree on one thing. You all got good steaks in Nebraska. <laughs> and there ain't no doubt about it. We went to steakhouses Monday and Tuesday night. Who, who watches TV? Who reads the paper? Anybody? Take a jab at it. Anybody? Anybody heard of the Barefoot Bandit? 
The kid out on the West Coast that stole the airplanes and flew them and stole all the cars, he was diagnosed with FASD. And I'll tell you another famous person that I would have never got. And until I read the newspaper, until I saw it in the press, did anyone know that Private Bradley Manning was diagnosed with FASD? He was. And we'll talk a little bit about him this afternoon. Because I was able to get from the military attorneys some transcripts. And they had a Navy psychiatrist testify at the hearing about how the mother was an alcoholic. So who would have guessed? Not me. So let's start with the judge, because his role is so important. When it comes to FASD, all judges, all attorneys, anyone working in the system needs to be trained. Judges need to be aware of the importance of stabilizing placement and not just sticking a kid with FASD in any home or any foster home. The first thing the judge must do is raise the question, is it possible that this child may have FASD? And I'm going to give you a story that is going to start now and it's going to go all the way through this afternoon. And it's a, a woman that I represented named Lisa. She had a brother and a sister. And the same judge presided over the dependency case. Because what happened was the LAPD went into the home for a call for domestic violence. And they found my client, Lisa, in an animal cage. No diapers, no clothing. Now, fortunately for the brother and the sister, they had very smart, educated social workers. And they took the brother to UCLA and had him diagnosed. The sister was later diagnosed at around age 10. My little gal goes 27 years of her life through the dependency court, the delinquency court, the juvenile court, the adult court, and later to prison. And the same judge in LA never one time asked the question, is it possible that any of these kids could have FASD. And when I got the transcripts from all of the dependency proceedings, despite the fact that the social workers had the diagnosis done, there was a breakdown of communication. Those reports never got into the social service file. That judge did not know. He didn't ask. But the early social service records said that the mother had a substance abuse problem. The mother disappears. No one knows where she goes. The father that abused my client ends up going to prison, later on deported back to Mexico. But judges should not assume that the issue has been dealt with from a prior judge sitting on the case. These are some questions that I think judges need to ask. Is there a history of alcohol or substance abuse in the family? Is there any history of prenatal alcohol exposure? What is the child's educational history? Special education? School disruptions, unexcused absences. I think if a judge sees these things, he needs to ask questions. What's going on? Let's pretend the kid's already been diagnosed. He or she needs to make sure that that child is getting the proper services, either in juvenile hall or in the community. 
Is there any history of mental illness, ADHD, or developmental disabilities? History of multiple placements, abuse or neglect, or the siblings in foster care, or the siblings in prenatal alcohol exposure at all? I think if the judge asks some of these questions, and he sees, okay, it's possible that mom did some substance abuse, then I think the next thing that needs to be done is the judge needs to order an evaluation of mom. Let's pretend the judge is one of the smartest judges. He has a lawyer in his court who doesn't know about FASD. This judge will now know and he can assist counsel. Did you investigate this counsel? Are you aware of these records? And as Larry mentioned, there needs to be a diagnosis done by an MD, a psychiatrist, a pediatric doctor, etc., neurologist. And I think one of the biggest, earliest mistakes that I made in my career is I got the wrong expert. So people will often ask, well, you must have all the services and all the doctors in California. And the answer is that is we're in the same boat that you're in. We have maybe two, maybe three, that are trained to diagnose FASD, to write reports, to come to court, and testify. So I hope one of the takeaway pieces that Larry and I are going to stress over and over again is if you start with a small community, let's go back to Norfolk. You get two local doctors. It doesn't have to be their full-time practice. That's what they did in Seattle. That's why all the leading experts in the country, that's why in 1973, in your materials, you will see Dr. Ken Jones, the father of fetal alcohol syndrome. He coined the term. So when I have judges say to me, well, Mr. Edwards, I have never heard of FASD. Can you give me some cases on it? How about case law? How about materials? And I'll say, it's been around for 40 years, Judge. And I love the response from a lot of the judges. Well, Mr. Edwards, I know for a fact that my mama drank martinis during pregnancy. And there ain't nothing wrong with me. Don't you think I'm normal? Sure. So I bite my tongue. And then I get tag teamed by the prosecutor. Well, Mr. Edwards, I've been a prosecutor for 25 years. And no one has ever raised this as a defense. Is this like the Twinkie defense that they made up in Texas? No. It's a valid defense. But maybe it's not just a defense. What we're going to talk about this morning and a lot this afternoon is you need to get services for these kids once you get the diagnoses to keep them in the community and to keep them reoffending. And we're going to go over your Nebraska statute. And we're going to talk about how you, as an attorney, probation officer, social worker, even judge, can suggest is the Division of Developmental Disabilities in Nebraska servicing these kids? And I know what the answer is going to be. It's the same answer we get in California. Well, their IQ is too high. Well, we're going to talk about how we can deal with that today, because I've got some suggestions for you. And I think 
public policy wise and changes, there's a lot that can be done. You can look at what Minnesota has done. And they've changed their definition of what constitutes a developmental disability, and it now includes FASD. Now, I, I already know what you're thinking, and I get this all the time. Well, they have a real drinking problem in Minnesota. <laughs> we don't have that here. And then I'll say, well, Alaska has done the same thing. And they've changed their definition, and it includes FASD. And then I get the same thing. Well, they really have a drinking problem in Alaska. No. Or, it's all natives. No, it's not. Yes, they have Yupik Eskimos there, but they have other people. People that just move there because they love the outdoors. So the take home message is we're going to really push to make sure that every child that gets diagnosed, we're going to talk about this this afternoon. How do you get SSI services for these kids? How do you get services from the state? So the judge needs to look at Intervention, treatment, and supportive services for these kids. He needs to make an inquiry. Is this child receiving services from the Developmental Disability Agency in Nebraska? In a case that I'm going to talk about mostly this afternoon, I'll just very briefly mention a couple facts because It was the first case in California where we were able to convince the disability organization. It's called the Regional Center in California. We were able to convince them to accept my client who had a 98 IQ, but very low adaptive. So another take home message is you have to look at the adaptive. We're going to go into that when we go into experts. You need neuropsychological testing that needs to be done. Well, in that case, we brought down Paul Connor, one of the leading neuropsychologists in the FASD field in the world. He's up from the University of Washington. And we were able to show that her executive functioning was so low, her adaptive level was like a four or five year old, and that's all we needed. The judge also needs to review all the social service reports and make sure that if there's any evidence of FASD or even prenatal alcohol or substance abuse exposure, it must be included in these reports. He needs to inquire about, is there any documented testing that's been done? Let's look at the educational supports and the medical treatment that this child needs. The judge, I think, also needs to assure that the educational component is complete. Is this child receiving all of the possible sources of special education that we have in the state of Nebraska? And this is going to tie into what the lawyer's role is going to be, because I think it's not just, okay, we get the diagnosis and we're done. No. You get the diagnosis, you advocate for the services, then you go and you educate and you advocate the part about special ed. And I think juvenile attorneys, public defenders, child advocates, whatever, we need to go to the IEP meetings. We need to be there because maybe the mom's not there. Maybe the mom's not around. Maybe she's still using alcohol. And I think the judge needs to make sure that the IEP mentions FASD. Now, we had this discussion on Tuesday with one of the teachers that was there. And of course, the teacher said, you know, I can't diagnose this. That's a fair question. But if you have evidence of prenatal alcohol exposure or prenatal substance abuse exposure, 
you can certainly put that in the IEP. That's proper. Maybe the grandmother told the school teacher that, yeah, mom's a boozer. She likes to drink. Maybe she's been arrested by the cop in Norfolk. She's drinking too much booze at the Holiday Inn. Comes outside, he arrests her. It's in the paper. The school could find out that. So I think then the judge can make this inquiry. Are the teachers trained? Boy, I certainly hope that judge in Norfolk has that meeting with the other judges. And I really hope this school teacher in Lexington goes back to her school and wants to train all the school teachers. Because we certainly have done a lot then in three days if we just get those two things done. So I think then the judge can inquire that all personnel in juvenile hall, or he can ask, is there anyone trained in juvenile hall to deal with AJ? Um, he's got FASD. Um, any psychologist in the juvenile halls that are trained in this? And any other professionals, therapist, uh, occupational therapist, anyone that has contact with the child needs to have some training. Does the child need to be placed? I know I use the word conservatorship, and I was told it's really a guardianship here in Nebraska, but does the child need to be placed on guardianship, et cetera? And the judge can make that inquiry as well. One of the things that the judge in L.A. certainly missed, and that was the question that we just talked about, and Larry talked about this, multiple generations in a family can and often do have FASD. So if that judge in L.A. would have inquired and ordered the social worker to come to court for the sister, tell me, Miss social worker, What's going on in this child's life? Anything? Yes, Your Honor. We've got her diagnosed. We had her diagnosed with FASD at UCLA. We're trying to get services for her. Bingo. That judge will now know. Big red flag. I better inquire about Mr. Edwards' client. And that judge didn't. The chain of damaged lives is, will be broken when the next generation is born free from prenatal alcohol exposure. So um, if that judge in L.A., the mother was still around at that point. We have records that she came to court. If the mom would have been ordered into substance abuse treatment or some kind of training to try to get those kids back, that was never done. And the mother kind of, the records show the mother kind of washed her hands of the child. So maybe the judge couldn't have done anything, but I think he could have inquired about all the siblings. They were all in his court. It was the same case. And I think one of the things that Larry mentioned this morning is that proper placements are so important. They need to be stable, nurturing, and a supportive environment. And one of the things that we'll talk about this afternoon is the positive things that these kids with FASD can do is unbelievable. And one of the things that AJ and I used to love to do when he was on death row is we would draw and color together. These kids are artistic and the judge needs to know and reinforce the positive things with these kids when he comes into the judge's court or she. And Larry will probably talk a little bit about that. Just the whole creativity that these kids have either through music or through art. That is really misleading. And I think another take home message one of the other biggest misleading things is I always thought 
that if the child had an IQ in the 90s or 100 or even 80, there's no way they have FASD. And we already know that's wrong. But I didn't know that in the 90s. What I did wrong was what Larry was talking about. And I think the first time after I moved back to California in 2001, my first assignment in LA was juvenile court. And I kept reading all these articles about FASD and facial features, man, I had it down. And I go to court and my first girl, she was 14. And I'm sitting here and she's sitting here and the prosecutor's over there and the judge is sitting right there. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at these, I'm looking for these damn facial features. <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking and I'm looking. And the judge said, Mr. Edwards, what is wrong? Mr. Edwards, what are you doing? Your, uh, Your Honor, I'm looking for the flat philtrum. What? What's that? A facial feature. Do you mind if I have a second? I have a tape measure. I want to measure her eyes. So the judge thought I was crazy. But that's what I thought. That's all I knew. That's what I read. So, as Larry was saying this morning, we're not just looking for that. I would say one case that I've had out of 12 did I ever have the facial features. And it was partial fetal alcohol syndrome was the diagnosis. And it was the case with Lisa, which we'll talk about this afternoon. All right, so let's talk about the attorney. How many lawyers do we have here today? Beautiful, half the room almost. All right, so we're going to focus a little bit on you guys. Well, what I think the role that you should do, your role is critical. And the first thing I want to do is, I want to just read briefly your definition of what is a developmental disability. Because I think all the lawyers need to look at this and say, okay, now I have a child with FASD, how am I going to advocate for services? What are my arguments going to be? So your definition, which is Nebraska Revised Statute 83, 1205, 1209, et cetera, A developmental disability is defined as an intellectual disability or a severe chronic disability other than an intellectual disability. And then it goes on to say that it's other than a mental or physical impairment caused solely by mental illness. But then it goes on, and here I think is the, the ticket language right here. Is manifested before the age of 22. Most states it's 18. The federal definition is 18. You guys, it's great. It's 22 here. And it's also 22 for special ed for all states under the federal statute. But here's your ticket item again. It's likely to continue indefinitely. Well, we already know what we learned this morning that that's true. So the argument is when your client has a 98 IQ. Now it's easy if he's 70 or below and the statute then goes into the adaptive behavior area, which we'll talk about later. But it's easy if the client's IQ is below 70 or right at 70. Then you've got him. They should take them and services them. 
But if your client's 98, this is the argument that you make. Is there anyone here from the Disability Law Center? Ah, oh, I wanted them here so bad because this is an area that they need to advocate in. And when we talk about Lisa's case, how we had to twist their arm in California to take not only one, but two cases that I had on. But this is cutting edge stuff that their office is mandated federally and state funding, as you know, protection and advocacy. So if you get the right case, this is your argument with them. Your girl, who's 14, was born with a developmental disability because mom drank during pregnancy. And she has permanent brain damage that she was born with prior to the age of 22. And it's going to continue indefinitely. We can't give her medication and make it go away. And later on, I'm going to show you guys an MRI. And there's some fancy stuff going up in Seattle, which I think is wonderful. And looking at the MRI of children and adults, and looking at the corpus callosum, which is the middle part of the brain that holds both sides together. And what Dr. Fred Bookstein up there is doing helped to save one of my client's lives by keeping him down in juvenile court. But also he helped get one of my client's services. Because when you take that MRI and you show them, this is a damaged corpus callosum. It's the most sensitive area of the brain when mom drinks. And I think Larry told you this. When the eyes are small, that means the brain's small. That's when mom drinks during that critical stage. But then you argue that the state of Nebraska has to take the client because of all the above. But more importantly, the adaptive behavior that it brings out and mentions in the statute. And it talks about receptive and expressive language. And you're going to have your neuropsychologist or your psychologist do a hell of a lot of testing in that area. And it's going to come up most of the time very low. So those are your arguments. And I think the more cases that you put together and push these guys to take these cases, that's what needs to be done until you change your definition of what constitutes a developmental disability. So attorneys, and we're going to kind of switch around here. We're going to talk about the red flags this afternoon. But you guys, we all need to know, what are the red flags? How do I know that my little gal may have FASD in juvenile court? What am I looking for? And we're going to talk about some of those red flags. The lawyer has to file motions with the judge through declarations of the birth mother, if you have that. We're going to talk about that this afternoon. There's some stuff in your uh, sample declarations that I've done on two cases. But more importantly, we're going to educate the judge. We want him to learn about FASD. And how are we going to do that? Are we going to give them one piece of paper? One article? No. Fifty. Lots. Judges love to read. <laughs> I'm going to give him all the way back from 1973, the first article that you have in your packet from Ken Jones. He's going to read that. And then I'm going to keep going, and I'm going to keep giving him a lot of articles so he sees how important this issue is and why we, as attorneys, need these experts to help in our case.
then we're going to fight for the best experts. So if the best expert's Larry Bird, I'm going to educate this judge on why I need Larry. If it's a serious case, and it's a 14-year-old kid they're going to try to put in adult court, I'm going to file my motion to get Paul Connor appointed from Seattle. And I'm sure the judge will do the same thing my judge did in L.A. Uh, no, we're not going to pay $4,000 for an evaluation. Okay. What do we do next as lawyers? We appeal it. I'm sure you can file a writ on it. You've got to set your record. You've got to have the reasons why you need these experts. Identify and address the cultural issues. I am so stoked that we have people here from the Ponca tribe. Because guess what? You might get a client who's got some cultural issues. Might be from a tribe. Maybe he came down here to hang out in Omaha with Granny. And he decided to go to the Holiday Inn and have a cocktail. He's 16, he has a fake ID. And you realize, wow, this kid may have FASD after I do all my investigation. But I don't know anything about the Ponca tribe, so I'm going to do my investigation on that. But I'll tell you some things, and here's why I'm glad they're here. probably just like Minnesota, just like Alaska, they have a higher prevalence for alcohol use on the tribes. And they have a higher suicide rate for kids and adults with FASD. The research shows that. So if we can get them to be trained Larry already got an invitation yesterday when we were at Norfolk to come out to some tribe and do a training, and then we're doing our job. Because their role is so important, and I'm so glad that they're here with us today. But the cultural issues also relates to the criminal justice proceeding as well. How the police interrogated that 14-year-old kid it, it deals with competency. We're going to talk about legal issues this afternoon. It deals with Miranda. You already heard Larry talk about their level of reading comprehension for fifth grade. So I got a 17-year-old kid who's in the judge's court. He's reading on a fourth grade level. Do you think he understands Miranda warnings? Probably not. Let's take a jab at this. How many police officers in Omaha are probably trained in FASD? Probably zero. We have to make a showing as attorneys why FASD is relevant. Not just for competency, not just for Miranda, not just for intent, but more importantly, your, your honor, I need to get services for this client because I don't want him in juvenile hall. I don't want him in the adult court. And if we're getting services right now, we're going to be able to keep him in the community. Uh -oh. any, uh, any computer uh, experts out there? I'm not one of those. It's kind of stalled on me. Ah, beautiful. All right. The attorney also needs to work with all the professionals, the mental health people, the medical doctors, et cetera, who have contact with the client. So the same question the judge asked, I'm going to ask the same question. Are the people working with my client in juvenile hall, in the foster home, or is anyone trained that come in contact with my client? I'm also going to request periodic conference calls or meetings with all service providers who the judge requires my client to be in contact with who work with my little client. 
Uh, and the other thing I think is important, and this is how I think you can reach out to Larry, or um, if you eventually have a case and if you want to contact me, I'll put you in contact with people that, that can consult with you, is I always want to make sure if I get a treatment plan, something that the judge wants the client to do or the prosecutor is insisting on that, I will get that treatment plan sent off to an expert. Maybe it's going to be Nat, Dr. Natalie Novick-Brown up in Seattle. Maybe it's Larry Bird. Larry, look at this report. This is what they want my client to do treatment-wise or expectation this judge has of my client who's reading on a fifth grade level or a fourth grade level. And I, I get feedback, and then I may go back and ask the judge, can we try something different? Does the client need more services? When I talk to Larry, he may say, hey, there's gaps in the services. The client doesn't have any vocational training. The client really needs a one-on-one -on -one tutor. You should ask for that. And after the FASD diagnosis is finally done, the attorney has to start advocating on all levels. This is what I mean by that. The lawyer needs to first look at the educational component attend all the IEP meetings. You have to go. When my office in LA said, well, we don't really go to IEPs as public defenders. Well, why not? I, mean, I want to be there. I want to see what the school's recommending, how I can advocate for the little client. Make sure the client has appropriate school accommodations. So what I do, if I don't know what they need, then I consult with a special education expert. You're going to have somebody in the state of Nebraska who's going to be up on special ed somewhere in the state. It's going to be a lawyer. It's going to be a parent. It's going to be a school teacher. Reach out to them and have them work with you. We went over this, but I'm going to hit this again. Argue that FASD is a developmental disability caused by brain damage that will result in both learning and behavioral problems. And I think Larry is going to talk about this this afternoon, but I'm going to kick it right now because it's such an important issue. We can't focus on just the behavior. Why? When my client comes to court, the judge keeps asking. He's fidgety. He, he won't sit still. He interrupts me. Why, Mr. Edwards? Judge, he's got brain damage. That's why. Let's not focus on his behavior problems, Your Honor. Let's focus on his impairments. And Larry will hit that hard this afternoon. He's going to go into that, about why that's important. Right, Larry? Oh, right. I think he's half asleep in the back. Cool. All right. We're going to make sure the child has an advocate at the school IEP and all the hearings. So yesterday we had some lovely people from CASA. Hey, court-appointed special advocates, they can go out there and do that stuff. Let's get them out there. Let's get CASA. Let's call the Nebraska Disability Law Center. Let's get them on there, too. They have to mandate, they're mandated to advocate for those issues. Let's get a killer lawyer out there, child advocate, fighting for this kid. The parents might not be available or the birth parents may still be struggling with addiction. So I had a case where I asked, I said, look, little Amy's got an IEP. What time's the meeting? The mom said. I said 11. Don't know, I can, I'm not sure if I can make it. So this was before we had her diagnosed with FASD. But I couldn't figure out what was up. So when I said, hey, I want to come over and talk to you tomorrow about your daughter, I'm going to come about 10 o'clock. Oh, no. Oh, no. I said, well, what's wrong? Are you busy? Are you working? And then I figured it out when I showed up the next day at 9.30. She starts boozing about 8.30. 9.15, she 
She was drunk as a skunk. Do you think she's going to be able to go advocate for this child and for the IEP? No. So that's important, too, to look at that as well. All right. We've kind of already mentioned this. Um, one of the things we're going to do when I'm done after the break, we're going to show a video that Larry and I had Tom Donaldson. He's the president of the National Organization on Fetal Alcohol Syndrome. Another great contact for you guys. Uh, you'll hear about them. Um, the president is Tom Donaldson. His dad is the famous journalist Samuel Donaldson. I'm sure you've all heard of him. So they do a lot of advocacy. They have a lot of big law firms that they work with that do a lot of amicus briefs. So if you guys get a primo case here, that's who you would reach out to for some advocacy support. Another thing for the attorney to do is make a referral to the mental health court for this child. Do you all have mental health courts here in Nebraska? Well, maybe we should get one together. Let's, let's create one. Maybe the judge in Norfolk can do that in his town. Because the mental health courts, I think, are, are good. And that's how I ended up getting Lisa. I, I'm back in the mental health court in LA, but my first go around, I was there for three years and I got transferred back to trials. But the mental health court was the best place that she could have ended up as a mentally disordered offender. And it's never too late to create a small mental health court. Um, I also think what a lot of states can do is what Judge Michael Jeffries has done up in Alaska. And he's created a special FASD court, but it's also focused around drug court. And a lot of the mothers that come there who need substance abuse training and treatment get screened. And what Judge Michael Jeffries has done, and if you ever want some of the materials, I can get them to you, he's made it mandatory for every probation officer in his courtroom to be educated on FASD so that when little Johnny doesn't show up for his appointment, he misses school, the probation officer's not going to go jump off the cliff and violate him. He's going to say, oh, whoa, all right, FASD. All right, all right, I won't, won't violate them. So it's something that can be done. And the next thing, I actually, I spelt this wrong, but again, this comes out of Lisa's case. The dependency court needs to communicate with a delinquency attorney and vice versa. I have dependency twice, so it was a typographical error. If you have a child who's in dependency court in front of this judge, and then Judge Jeffries down the hall is a delinquency court, and there's a filing of a criminal trespass, the lawyers need to communicate on what's going on. Because maybe you're looking at FASD on the trespassing case, and this lawyer in dependency court has no clue what that even is. So we got to communicate on those issues, I think, as a team. All right, we're going to... We're going to skip up to interviewing mom, maternal alcohol history. I like this cartoon here, or drawing. At the bottom, easy day, rough day at the top, don't even ask, I've had a crappy day. Um, and this is what I do, uh, and I learned this um, after working on a lot of cases. When I go out to interview moms, I take a little briefcase, and I take a shot glass, a wine glass, a highball glass, and a small little glass that I think are used for screwdrivers. And sometimes I'll take a margarita glass. Not all the time, but sometimes I do. So what I do is, when I'm interviewing mom, we're going to talk about the container of the alcohol that she drinks in. We're going to go more into that as we proceed. Well, that's why we have the out. This is pretend alcohol up here. All right. So the attorney representing the child must obtain the history of the maternal alcohol consumption from all sources. So here's the 
first big mistake that I made, I just figured, okay, well, after I interviewed mom and she was in denial and she says, nah, I never drank through pregnancy. I've never drank any booze at all. I just smoke marijuana. Despite the fact of having in my file a DUI record that we got, I didn't think that was relevant, so I just figured, okay, well, I'm not going to go any further in my questioning. That client probably doesn't have FASD. So I was wrong because you don't just stop with mom. You have to interview lots of people. So the attorney representing the child should not try and interview the birth mother about the maternal alcohol history of drinking without being trained. This piece at the top was taken out of an article that Larry and I, uh, I talked about, it's going to be published sometime this summer. And the reason why this came out of a training that Larry and I did in Wisconsin, we were talking about this, Dr. Natalie Novick Brown and I were already thinking about this because there was just nothing for an attorney to pull up and find an article that says, how do I interview the birth mother? How do I get the maternal alcohol history that is so important to getting the diagnosis? So we decided to write this article. It's going to have screening, screening questions in it. I'm going to go over some of the questions that we have in the article. Okay. So maternal alcohol exposure is a stigmatizing issue for us to deal with. It's very challenging. It's complicated if the mother is still using. And again, the story I gave you about the woman who I said, I'll get there at 11, I'll get there at 10. And she just wasn't going to tell me I'm going to be drunk, so come at 830. So we kind of have to learn these things as we're doing this work. And alcohol use, uh, we have to get it from other people. And I'll give you an example. I had a case where mom says, um, I drank a little before pregnancy, but as soon as I knew I was pregnant, I stopped. And for some reason, after interviewing about 20, 30, 40 birth mothers, I didn't think she was telling me the truth. And I guess it's also the naive or just being a public defender. You have to trust every client that you deal with. And one of the things I learned from my mom as growing up as a child and as an older adult, that my bullshit odometer is not very good. And I just believe everybody. I trust everyone. And I think we have to have that attitude and say, OK, if mom's not going to be straight forth with me, and there's lots of reasons why she's not. She's going to be thinking, okay, this judge right here, he's going to take my child away from me if I tell you that I've been boozing. I'm going to lose my child. It's one thing. They're in denial. They need treatment, but they're not in treatment. So in that case, what I did was I went out and I interviewed dad who was in prison. And we said, hey. We need to talk to you about the birth mother. Um, he said, well, yeah, she drank like I did. We would drink pints of brandy. She drank up until the day that she gave birth. And that's all we needed right there. But I didn't stop there. Because I had a judge who just wasn't buying this stuff. And even though we had dad's declaration, he said, hey, interview the sister, because she's going to have some good stories to tell you. And we did. And when we interviewed her, we found out just how bad this drinking problem really was. And it wasn't just drinking, it was meth as well. And her declaration was invaluable in finally convincing the judge, OK, you need this expert. You have the maternal alcohol history. You have evidence of prenatal alcohol exposure. And also, 
the other problem that Larry mentioned this morning is a lot of these kids that we're going to get are going to be in foster care. They may be adopted. I have a case right now where the kid was adopted from Russia. Big boozers over there, man, with vodka. Whoa. And we're just not going to have mom. Or in Lisa's case, and in AJ's case, we're going to talk about mom was out of the picture completely. So I think a lot of another take home message is if you don't have the birth mother, don't give up hope. Because you can find someone, even if it's the neighbor, that knew mama drank during pregnancy. Every effort should be made to obtain the necessary information, but lack of confirmation of alcohol use during pregnancy should not preclude an FASD, it should say FASD diagnoses. And Larry mentioned this, if you have um, all the facial features, which is you know, 10, 15% of the time, you have damage to the central nervous system through testing, um, if you just have evidence that mom used substance abuse, you can still get a diagnosis of FAS. Um, documentation that the birth mother did not drink any amount of alcohol. Um, and this is, for example, I had a case where we just could not prove that mom drank. And that's because she was incarcerated two months after she conceived. And prior to that, she was in a hospital and there was no way we could show that she drank and it's important to keep in mind where was the mother if she's incarcerated is she having sex okay is it possible that she used substance and I think in that case we could not because she was prevented from drinking both being in a psychiatric hospital and being in prison. But I've had smart prosecutors and they, they've said to me, but, but Mr. Edwards, everyone has access to drugs and booze in prison. Great, fair question. But there's no studies, there's no evidence, there's no cases that a woman has drank herself to death and then conceived a child who was born with FASD. Now, I've had cases and it's out there and I'll have a lot of prosecutors they'll ask this question too. Well, what's the difference between a client that's exposed to crack cocaine or meth? I mean, is this the same thing we're talking about? And as Larry said this morning, no, it's not. I don't care how much meth you smoke or crack, you're not going to have the damage that alcohol causes on the baby's brain. We're going to skip that. Okay. So when you're looking for the confirmed prenatal alcohol exposure, you get it from the following ways. Clinical observations. The mother's in a substance abuse treatment program. She's observed by a therapist or a doctor. She talks about her problems. It's documented. Self-report. Mom tells you. Yes. A lot, and keep this in mind, and we're going to really hit this hard is that most mothers will come out and tell you, yes, I did drink prior to pregnancy, but no, I did not during. And it's easier to get out that from them. And if you do have that, you're more than three-fourths the way home, I think. You can argue, well, if she drank prior to pregnancy, maybe she did during pregnancy as well. Um, reliable informants, we talked about that. Also from social, legal, or medical problems that the mother had relating to drinking during the pregnancy. You know, we really have to do a, a good investigation on mom's background. Prenatal care, um, did she have prenatal care, why not? Um, get the records on the mama. Um, problems that we're going to face the child was adopted, exposure is unknown, the birth mother is an alcoholic but confirmed evidence of exposure during pregnancy does not exist, she's in complete denial 
No, I never drank at all after I knew little Johnny was coming inside of my stomach. Once I found that I was pregnant, I stopped drinking margaritas in Tijuana. Conflicting reports about exposure often exist. So you might have records, and I think this is another sensitive area. You go to do the interview of the birth mother, and you have records of a DUI, social service reports, public intoxication. Mom got arrested at the Hilton last night. She got drunk, went outside. You have to be careful when you use that during the interview. You can't just come out and confront her. And this afternoon I'm going to go into how to interview a child or client. Um, it's different than interviewing an adult. So I think we have to step back. We have to take our attorney hats off. And we have to be sensitive during the interview, compassionate, show love, and explain to the mother that it's OK if you are struggling or have struggled with an addiction problem. All right. The mother's history. This is a child. This was a, one of the first cases that Dr. Ken Jones did in 1973 that he later followed around. Um, so here's some red flags for lawyers to look at when it comes to um, looking at the maternal alcohol history. Previous child with FAS that was born, um, evidence of, of polysubstance abuse, alcohol use prior to pregnancy, uh, single woman, smoker, Larry went over this, um, history of physical or sexual abuse in the family, history of mental illness, and we also have to look at the uh, partner or the mother's alcohol use as well. Keep in mind that alcohol may not be the mother's number one drug of choice. So I heard the story yesterday that I guess crack cocaine is pretty expensive in Nebraska, so everybody gets high on meth. So let's just pretend that meth is mom's drug of choice. And let's add in there another fact. She's got bipolar. She goes and sees a psychiatrist at the clinic. She runs out of her prescription medication. She can't get meth, so she boozes. Or you'll get the mama that gets super high on the meth. And the more meth you use, the quicker you get high, the quicker you come down. So when you're high and there's no more meth, often mama will use alcohol. So Keep in mind that if mom says, yeah, you know, I just I use a little bit of crack cocaine once in a while and I smoke marijuana, that's about it. But I don't touch the booze. So do you investigate and dig further? Yes. I think another red flag take home message. I think it's ineffective assistance of counsel for any attorney to know that the mother uses some kind of substance and does not investigate FASD. Now, most of the cases are in the federal level, and it's mostly a death penalty case, and they've overturned it because of ineffective assistance of counsel because the lawyer didn't investigate FASD. So I think if you have the red flag that mom was in a treatment program, she may have used, she has one arrest for a DUI. Now I've had lawyers say, okay, you know what? A lot of my kids have mothers who get DUIs. Am I supposed to investigate every case? No, you can't. Because this judge isn't gonna give you FASD experts on 14 of your 22 cases. But keep in mind of Larry's statistics. How many cases do we have in Nebraska? That's what you hit him over the head with when you file your motions. So I think we have to investigate that. A lot of these cases were federal decisions, where federal judges overturned a death penalty case because the lawyer had evidence through the father, the birth father that, that mama may have drank. 
there were records and that lawyer failed to investigate that. So I think we got to keep that in mind. And also keep in mind that some women may not realize there is no safe kind of alcohol. And I'll give you an example. I go over to this mother's house over in South Central LA. I tell her I'm going to get there about 10 o'clock. I figured I learned my lesson from the past. I'm going to get there as early as I can. So I get there, we talk, and she says, well, you know, I just, I drank a couple wine coolers. That's eh, no big deal. Okay. So I take my nifty glasses and I said, well, ma'am, can you show me, when you say wine coolers, how much booze are you putting in the glasses? And how many glasses are you drinking? So she gets a wine cooler out, and I get my, my glasses out. Oh, bring them over here. So she says, well, I said, I want you to show me how much wine coolers we're talking about here. So she says to me, well, does it matter if they're a, a pina colada or margarita pina colada? Or, does it matter? No, it doesn't, but I want you to show me. So here's Mama. It's already filled up. And she kept filling it all the way to the top. And I said, wow, how many of those did you have in one night? Twelve. That's a lot of wine coolers. So I think the purpose of the, of the, of the glasses and the sizes, because if you have a mother that says, well, I did a couple shots. Well, show me any, how many shots you had when you made your margarita. I need to know. So the other thing that mamas are not going to realize is that there's just no safe kind of alcohol. She said, hey, my brother-in-law is a psychologist in, at the school, and he said, ah, oh, you know, a wine cooler is not going to matter. Okay? Here's a great story. Larry and I are waiting last night to catch the shuttle. Go have some dinner. We're over here at the Hilton. Got a bunch of people in there doing happy hour. And the four women out by the door, and they're waiting for the same shuttle that we're waiting for. And this one woman says, Larry, did you enjoy those cocktails? And she said, yeah. And the other woman said, are you pregnant yet? You know, I think I am. And she says, well, I heard it's okay to drink. My doctor said a couple glasses of wine won't hurt anything. And Larry and I are standing there, and we're like, do we say anything? Or do we just stand here? And Larry's like, well, I don't know. I said, we shouldn't say anything. No, we're not. So there's the education level of these kids. Maybe they're in college, I'm guessing. And they're thinking it's cool. And their doctor, who knows where he works at, I'm assuming he's in Nebraska, telling her, eh, a couple glasses of wine won't hurt anything. Just a couple. The mama also may not realize that there is no safe time to drink during pregnancy. At all. And they're often going to say, you know, I quit as soon as I found out I was pregnant. But the research and studies show that a lot of mamas are maybe three months along, two and a half, and they have no idea they're pregnant. And one of the things that Larry will probably talk about this afternoon, I'll talk a little bit about it, but mamas that binge drink. And that's what happened to little Lisa. And we're going to show a, a video toward the end of the day that, that the National Organization on Fetal Alcohol Syndrome put together. It's called A Child for Life. Because these kids are a child for life because their brains are never going to change once mom drinks. And one of the women in the video tells you 
that she went out because her and her boyfriend broke up. And she said, I'm going to teach those guys I can drink. And she binge drinks. And she doesn't know she's pregnant. And you'll see the child on the video. And it's very moving. And I've taken the video and I've given it to judges. I've let them look at it. It's a great video. Um, we'll talk about how you can get a copy of that and all that later on. Um, this is something that I think is really cool. All right. This is three weeks right there. The central nervous system is starting to already form all the way up till the birth of the child. These are some red flags we're going to talk about later on, but heart murmurs. I've had a couple cases with seizures and heart murmurs. When the arms and the eyes and the teeth, when mom's drinking. And also, this is right around the time here when the hands start to form. And I think one of the things I learned from Dr. Ken Jones is a lot of these kids, I couldn't figure out why one of my cases, my little 14 or 13 year old girl, she kind of had a limp when she walked. And I didn't pay attention to it. And then the more research I did, I realized a lot of the early work that Ken Jones did was a lot of these kids have orthopedic problems, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. And a lot of them were born with what they call hockey puck hands, these kids. So again, don't do what I did. Don't look at the kid's face, but look at things and be aware of the child's body. Because in one of the cases, we later found out the kid did have a hockey puck hand. And what happens is this, is that when, when, the, when the baby is in the mother's womb, okay, we're able as a child, we're able to freely move around in there. But when the, the picture at Larry showed, when, when mom was boozing, the, the kids don't have a chance to move their hand. So the kids are born with a hockey puck crease. Or maybe they don't move their legs. And that's why you have orthopedic problems often with some of these kids. So keep in mind, it's from the beginning to the end, damage that's done when mom drinks. How much drinking is necessary? I get a lot of calls on this. And, you know, I have prosecutors that'll say, well, if mama only had two or three drinks, come on, how's the kid damaged? I'm not buying that. And then what a lot of prosecutors have done is there are some studies, and I'm not sure if Larry mentioned this or not, there's some bad studies out there that were done in Europe, but they're small sample studies. And the studies shown that there was light drinking that was done by mom, and the kids had no behavior problems, no HDA, ADHD, et cetera. And some sneaky prosecutors will take those articles and say, look, judge, Here's an article on light drinking. This kid doesn't have FASD. Well, there's a lot of stuff you can hold up and a lot of stuff that NOFAS has done to counter those arguments. So we have to be ready for those arguments, okay? So seven or more drinks per week, 12 ounce beer. Again, why I do the measuring. Five ounces of wine, 1.5 ounce of hard liquor. Binge drinking is four to five drinks. So if a woman's had four to five drinks out of the gate, she's considered a binge drinker. So I looked at this and I was looking at this research and I'm like, shit, man, am I a binge drinker? I mean, because I've gone to a barbecue and I've had four or five drinks and it, it may be uh, six hours, so I'm ugh, probably not. But that would be considered a binge drinker, and I think the evidence shows, and I think Larry will mention this this afternoon, that's the most damage the mama can do to these kids. And I think a lot of the research shows that a lot of these mamas that binge drink, that's where you're going to have the kids that are more likely going to have mental retardation or intellectual disabilities. Larry mentioned this, but I want to hit this home again. I wanted to make sure I had this slide just to hit it over the head of you guys. Is 
If there's any signs the mother drank, we must go back three generations. We have to interview the mother and the grandmother if we can. And this is why it's so much easier when we have little kids, because the chances are my 52-year-old client, grandmom's probably, maybe possibly dead. But if the, tw the child's 12 or 14, grandmom's probably still around. And that's critical. And it's easier to get services for kids in most states for people that have developmental disabilities than it is when they're 52. It's much harder then. We talked about this, but the lawyer, you got to look at the mother's medical problems, if there are any, cultural, environmental, nutritional, psychological, and issues of poverty. I'm just going to go over a couple quick um, questions that I think you guys can kind of take home. When asking about the use of any substances, frame the question by asking, how many, rather than did you? So if I ask the mom, did you, you're automatically blaming her. You're automatically coming out, okay? And it's almost like an interrogation. Just say, you know, how, how many did you have? Asking how many gives the mother permission to acknowledge that she did drink during pregnancy. This way of interviewing is also very good for spouses and siblings as well. What I do is I do a timeline, and, and this is what I do when I'm doing my social history, is I want to look at the questions and I want to look at substance use prior to pregnancy. And again, most women are likely to acknowledge alcohol use prior to pregnancy. Prior to pregnancy recognition, and then post-pregnancy recognition. Again, the drinking patterns are very important. That's why I do this, my experiments, over the time period, and I look at the outcomes. How many hours does she drink? Does she eat? Etc. These are some questions. Before you knew you were pregnant, what was the most number of drinks you drank? on any one occasion. And there what I do is I take into consideration, okay, you went to a fraternity party, you went to a wedding, your boyfriend took you to Hawaii, how many cocktails did you have in Hawaii? You went with your sister down to Florida, the Keys, how many cocktails did you have when you were down there? What type of alcohol beverage do you prefer? This allows the mother to estimate alcohol use. Does she like straight shots? Is she a wine drinker? Is she a big on margaritas? What does she drink? Is she a closet drinker? I had a lot of mamas that I've interviewed that would hide the booze from the husband. He didn't, she didn't, he didn't even know that she was boozing. And the size of the container that we talked about. It's so important, the size of the container, if you can take those with you and use them when you're interviewing or your social worker. Another good question. In the last 30 days before you found out you were pregnant, how many drinks did you have? These are some other questions. I'm not going to read all of these, but you can, they're in the materials. Some of the good questions are how many drinks does it take before you begin to feel the effects of alcohol? And I had a, a client, I just interviewed the mama, and she was also over in East LA in what they call the hood of LA. And uh, I got to her house about 8.30 in the morning and interviewed her. And uh, we started talking about alcohol, and I asked her, I said, so what is your primary, when you drink, what do you drink? And she said, oh, I love margaritas. I can drink six or seven a day. I said, how about anything else? So she looks at me, she says, didn't they just pass some law about marijuana in California? 
And I said, yeah. Do you have a prescription? And I said, no. Well, I want to tell you something because, see, now I like to smoke marijuana. And I think what I do is when I get really high, I can't figure out why I get so high on only six margaritas. So then it kicked in. And I'm like, okay, what she's doing is she's getting super high on the weed and then she's drinking the booze. So I've represented enough of clients to know when they're high and I could tell she was high. So it was about 10.30 and she looks at her watch and she says, what are you doing for lunch? I'm hungry. I said, no, I'm not sure. You want to get some burritos? Sure. So next thing I know, front door bellboy rings. It's some man with six burritos, hand delivered. She says, you get one and I get four. Well, who's the other one for? My boyfriend. OK. I said, you're going to eat four burritos? Yeah. All day. You got to have something when you're drinking. So I got not only the alcohol, but we got the drug addiction out of her as well. So these are just some questions. We're not going to go over all of them. Um, another key area, too, is really understanding the mother's medical issues. Does she have diabetes? If she does, the medical journals are talking about how this greatly increases the risk of FAS fetal alcohol exposure. Is the mother zinc deficient? Now, a lot of these studies, especially with the zinc, is based around a lot of work that Ed Riley and those guys, Sarah Matson does down there in San Diego State. And a lot of it's they are injecting these rats and stuff, but it's still good stuff. It's still materials that I think, I remember I gave a prosecutor uh, one of these studies on the zinc stuff, and he calls me, he's like, this article's about rats. I said, yeah, I get it, I know, but read it. It talks about mothers or the rat being zinc deficient and giving her alcohol. They inject the rats with booze and you later find out that the fetuses are damaged. So it's good stuff to read. So he wasn't convinced, but if you read enough of the articles, and there's stuff out there not just on rats, but a lot of women that are vitamin deficient also are going to have pregnancy, problems with the pregnancy. Uh, does the birth mother ever suffer from mental illness or has been seen by a psychiatrist? We have to understand the mom's medical background when we're doing these interviews and putting together the social history. Is there a history of mental illness in the family? The mother may have mental illness, as we talked about, cannot afford the prescribed medication and will self-medicate on alcohol. Um, we're going to kind of just go fast, but I think one of the, the big pieces in this little slide was the alcohol abuse is associated with 25 to 50 percent of all suicides, depression, and alcohol abuse. Um, and I think one of the things that Larry already talked about, but he will this afternoon, is if we don't get these kids services, then they're going to end up with the secondary disabilities. And a lot of these clients that I've seen are going to have either suicide attempts or a lot of depression, and it's all related to the brain damage and the substance abuse history that they're uh, living with. Um, this is for everyone, I think, in the criminal justice system, but I think in order to really understand children who have FASD, Judges, probation officers, prosecutors, social workers, everyone must undergo a paradigm shift in the, pro the approach of how we deal with these kids. And the, appro the appropriate approach is to accommodate the cognitive and physical disabilities through appropriate support systems rather than to attempt to obtain compliance by intermediate sanctions. And again, Larry hit this, and I'll hit it again. It's not looking at the behavior of these kids. It's looking at their impairments. How do we treat those impairments? How do we understand them? Support systems need to be institutioned both during the prosecutorial process and with regard 
to post convictions, such as supervision, counseling, and treatment of these kids that are in juvenile court. This is especially something that um, Larry talked about, but again, we have to educate the courts and all others in the system that FASD is not an excuse. It's an explanation for the child's behavior. Again, looking at the impairments that these kids have. We're going to skip over this. And, uh, we're going to stop here, take a little break. We're going to show the no fast DVD of Tom Donaldson, then I think we'll shut her down for lunch, and then we'll start back up after lunch.